So good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming. This is the first and hopefully a series of interviews of candidates running for office for North Carolina primary election in the school board and the county commissioner's elections. So today I've invited Craig Sink, who is running for county commissioner here in McDowell County. And we're going to give him an opportunity to um, express his, his positions, his beliefs, and I've proffered some questions to him and we'll go over theirs. But first I wanna introduce Craig Sink. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate your time here. If you wanna just quickly introduce yourself, a little bit about your background and what qualifies you to run for a county commissioner. Okay, thank you, Tina. Uh just so your viewers know, I am a conservative Republican from Southern California who moved here in 2021 after retiring from the Port of Long Beach in Los Angeles County. Among other, among other things, I have a background in managing large infrastructure projects and hope to use my knowledge of contracts, bidding, and managing uh, construction projects uh, for the county of uh, of McDowell. I'm a Vietnam veteran and I live here in the Monford Cove area. This is my first time for running for political office. Really quickly, what prompted you to run for office? Well, I saw there was a need uh, here in the county for uh, people with different points of view. Uh, uh, different perspectives. Sometimes if we're involved in something, we get caught up in the same same circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I can bring uh, a, a fresh pair of eyes to it and impartiality to uh, the County Board of Commissioners. Fantastic. Um, to give people an idea, when you talk about managing infrastructure, can you give the public an idea of the size of the Long Beach, I mean, I've lived there, I know, but to give people an idea, what capacity are we talking about? Who are, how many people are we managing? You know, what all these moving parts going on, um, what's the capacity there in your experience in that area? Well, just about everything that, that you see in your Dollar General or your Walmart is coming through the Port of Long Beach or the Port of Los Angeles. That facility is a huge facility that be, has been used since pre-American uh, times. Uh, the, the Spanish uh, had it at one time. The mission system uh, in California used it. But it uh, the municipality of Long Beach is 500,000 people set in Los Angeles County and abuts the port of Los Angeles. Uh, so everything that you see in the stores pretty much comes through there unless it's coming from Europe or someplace in South America. So we're talking large scale infrastructure management. That, that is true. And I was just a team member of a very <laughs> large organization. That facility, by the way, has been under construction continuously mm. since the since the gold rush. Fa fabulous. And Okay, so let's get into my first question. Um, according to North Carolina statutes, the role of the board member is to create change, abolish and consolidate county government, change the composition, the manner and selection of boards, commissions and agencies, promote orderly and efficient administration of county affairs, but may not abolish what is required by law, take action specifically forbidden by law, stop or reassign a function or duty assigned by law, change the composition or selection of the local board of education, board of health, board of social services, board of elections, and board of alcoholic beverage control. In light of this, could you tell us a little bit about your experience qualifying in those areas? We just kind of talked about that. I'm gonna jump back in right into question number two. For the sake of respecting everyone's time, let's talk about what you believe are the top three issues facing the county 
that need attention. We're going to talk about what the issue is. We're going to talk about what problem it presents to the community. And then we're going to talk about what solution that you could provide. Okay, well, as far as priorities, if we're just going to take the top three, let's talk first about property taxes. That seems to be on everybody's mind. It certainly was in California in the 1970s with uh, Proposition 13. Proposition 13 was resisted by the public sector, public service sector in uh, California because they felt that the monies to support the public service sector would be uh, withheld or withdrawn. Uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. Things have worked uh, properly. So property taxes is is my number one issue. Second would be impartiality. People here believe that there is favoritism, not only amongst the board, but just generally within the social structure here. And they're suspicious of that favoritism. The other is cultural Marxism, which is infiltrating not only county government, but the schools and uh, probably city government. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only happening here, it's happening nationwide and perhaps globally, but it, we can't solve those problems or that infiltration, but we can here at the local level. Mm -hmm. So those are the three main areas of concern. The property tax issue is, if I had my say and could convince the other board commissioners, uh, I would propose that there be no new taxes until 2026. And beginning in 2026, limiting property tax increases to mo no more than 2% a year. Mm -hmm. That is generally inflation. Sometimes it's going to be a little higher, sometimes it's going to be a little lower. But there could always be supplemental tax increases if inflation really got out of control and we were unable to to make payroll or to uh, uh, provide public service yes and provide for retirements uh, unfunded liabilities as they're called uh, so th but i would propose that n no new tax increases until at least 2026 and then only two percent a year there's an old maxim in economics that says that there's an a limited supply but an unlimited demand. Mm -hmm. That means that we all want more. No matter what we have, we want more. And that is true of government too. So we're going to have to look for efficiencies in government to see how we can keep from rapid increases in the cost of government. Okay. Second uh, the, that I brought up was impartiality. Uh, yeah, explain what you mean by, by that. Give us well, an example of a scenario that, that might come into play. Well, it isn't so much as an example. It's a perception. Okay. And if people perceive, perceive that there's impartiality in the way government operates, they're going to be distrustful of the government. And If there the, is partiality, not impartiality, correct? Uh, excuse yeah. me. Thank you for correcting yeah. me. If there is a perception of, of partiality... Uh, then there probably is some partiality. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not much, but it's enough to to affect the people's perception of their own government. And by that, I mean our local government. So uh, I would endeavor to keep the discussion of agenda items uh, that are discussed by the Board of Commissioners public. That is, I would endeavor to, to keep the commissioners speaking about the agenda items in public, discussing them in public. Anytime you have three or more commissioners meeting in private to discuss county business, you're having a county you're having a county meeting and that county meeting should be public. Mm -hmm. I know it's a commissioner's meeting, but the public is invited to listen in on that. Mm -hmm. And really that holds us all to accountability. So that's a good thing uh, to do. I would also advocate that the agenda items that are put out before the meetings might be published and that they be as detailed as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not trying to burden uh, staff more than they already are, but I think if a full description of, of the agenda item be published and be available when we come into the meeting would be uh, an improvement. It, it's 
it's important for the public to attend meetings and to be involved. And I have heard personally myself that when people have attended the board meeting, something will be brought up and they'll they'll have no context of, of which to understand the item that's being discussed or voted upon, which does not lend itself to transparency. And it's probably for efficiency's purpose or whatever, but that's maybe an oversight that could easily be solved by a public relations press release on, you know, like you said, okay, here's what's coming up at the meeting. Here's what we're dealing with. This is what's on the table. You know, please attend. You know, just something as simple as that, right? Well, I, I think that is a is a good suggestion. Uh, I also believe that the public has a, 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 an interest in this. And I don't know all of the answers to what needs to be done here. So I'm open to listening to anybody on any subject regarding the county business. Uh, it should be open and transparent. And I think most of the uh, commissioners endeavor to uh, listen to the public, particularly if they know the individuals who are talking to them. Uh, but it's, it's important to keep your doors open to everybody uh, so that they can uh, have a say in the way the government is, is run here. The issue? Uh, the third issue was uh, cultural Marxism. Uh, there's hardly any place you can go without seeing cultural Marxism, and it's infiltrating our county government. And by cultural Marxism, I mean things like DEI or critical race theory or gender uh, equality, uh, radical feminism would be another example. Uh, there's probably more on the horizon that we haven't even heard of yet. Mm -hmm. But these ideologies are insidious and they're anti-American. They're anti-individual freedom and they need to be stopped. We, You and I don't, cannot stop this at the federal level. We can't stop it at the state level, but we can stop it at the county level. And so I would endeavor to, I would advocate to remove any woke ideological terminology from county do documents and policy. And oftentimes that's going to come from the very people who are staffers within the county. They're going to know where these things exist. The school board uh, is currently embroiled in an issue over books, which I would consider cultural uh, Marxism. Mm -hmm. uh, so the public is aware of it and can bring it to our attention, but it's up to us to act and and use the power of policy to keep it from happening or to weed it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to move on to question number three. In recent years, we've seen phenomenal growth in our county, and some of it some people have said that it's happening faster than really what we can keep up with and it's kind of caught us off guard so in 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 that thinking we don't currently have a finished master you know comprehensive master plan for the county right that determines the standards of our growth a vision for what we want to be in the future on expansion we don't have a needs assessment that's, I'm going to say, um, comprehensive enough, like for each department, correct? So in simpler terms, you know, we really don't know as a county, what do we want to be when we grow up, <laughs> right? That's kind of the question that I often put to, to people when they think, what do you want McDowell County to be? We love people moving in here and what they bring in their, in their energy and their businesses and things like that. But we also want to retain the unique quality of what McDowell County is. We have a great source of natural resources that we want to preserve and protect. Um, mm -hmm. We want our residents and our visitors to enjoy that, right? Um, we want to have the infrastructure, but thoughtfully and mindfully um, economic development produced in, in our county so that we, we don't come back from vacation and have it looking like some, I've lived in many towns where that's happened, where there was no forethought and no planning and you come and the things that you love about your community are gone now, or they're no longer there, right? They're eroded. Um, that's True. happened in Asheville, where yes. you see that there, that growth, you know, chase was so strong that what happens is the community itself is left 
unrecognizable to those that grew up and, and fell in love with it and often changed the things that brought people and attracted people in tourism and brought tax dollars was the very thing that is giving it a bad reputation now, right? So how do we avoid that? Well, that, that that's sad. And it's happened to me many times in my life. Uh, even the one year that I was in Vietnam, things had changed when I got home. Uh, the county that I come from had 200,000 people in it when I was born. It now has 3.2 million. Uh, it, that growth is has changed the place. However, they were very good about their strategic plan. Mm -hmm. It was it was well thought out, more so later on than early on. Mm -hmm. But I think that's true of Asheville. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some roads and sideways uh, trails in Asheville that make it hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. The point I'm trying to make is growth is inevitable. Population growth is inevitable. It's going to happen everywhere. The United States population is what about 330, 340 million now. That's not it's not going to slow, it's not going to go down. Yeah, it's, and it's not a bad it, thing. It's no. just yeah. Yeah, it, that's just the way things are. But by strategic plan, I think you're referring to a, a general plan or a land use plan, meaning uh, a map with supporting documentation that lays out generally the types of uses land can be put to or used for in different areas of the county. A as an example, you wouldn't want an ammunition factory uh, next to neighborhoods mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or or a bar next to a school. There are, mm -hmm. are different ways to, to they, they, these things can exist but they have to exist in areas that are laid aside for that use. Some of it's natural. As an example, later on, we're going to talk about residential development. There is, a, or housing, I think, is the way that you mentioned it to me. There are corridors where residential is going to work better than others. As an example, access to freeways, the I-40 corridor, mm -hmm. people who are going to move into housing here are going to want access to I-40 if they're commuting up to Asheville mm -hmm. or if they're commuting down to Statesville, anywhere else. The the two, two, 221 is one of those corridors, on-ramps uh, and access to the freeway like Ashworth or Sugar Hill Road are natural uh, mm -hmm. draws for her. access. To, so those roads need to be paid attention to. And it looks like the county's done a pretty good job, at least here in Marion, on Sugar Hill. Frankly, that new bridge and the way that that's laid out, it's going to improve access on and off that freeway, which lends itself to real estate development for residential housing. Mm -hmm. There might also be consideration giving, given to a an on-ramp slash off-ramp off of I-40 onto, excuse me for just a second, that we, uh, that we have uh, between us and Old Fort, we could look at adding an on-ramp or an off-ramp so the development of residential or of property along that corridor could eventually occur. Mm -hmm. Now, these are long-term plans or goals, 10 years, 20 years down the line. But the sooner you start planning these sorts of things out, the, the better it makes the end result. And roads are a big aspect of that. Yeah. Drainage off those roads, storm drains, Mm -hmm. All of those things lend themselves to an improvement. Now, you also have to set aside the stuff that we all want here, which is recreation. People mm -hmm. will come here for recreation, for tubing, for horseback riding, for the lake. There are mm -hmm. uh, That's a right spot on the horizon for McDowell County. I believe it is, too. Right. Uh, but if the people are stuck in traffic jams because they're trying to get to these places... The, that won't work either. Or so if they the, buy a house on the lake and they can't traverse conveniently back and forth to commerce, correct. that's an issue as well. So there, there are a lot of moving parts to any strategic master plan, but you're right. The needs assessment and the overall, you know, the a, a comprehensive 3000 kind of viewpoint of what is growth look like? You know, what can we predict out? Can we do a needs assessment? Can we do some evaluation? 
where are our, and then identify where are our priority areas. And I think the county has done a great job with Sugar Hill and identifying that as a priority area. I think that's fabulous. And they've done their research and the work. So, but I think more of that um, is done and it, and it is a big job and committees, I think community led committees might, might help with some of the legwork on that too. Absolutely. And my thought would be a planning commission, a county planning commission of volunteers, similar to what McDowell, or excuse me, it, similar to what Marion has. They mm -hmm. have a plan to make a municipality. Well, the county can do basically the same thing, but that committee would probably take 10 years just getting, well, five anyway, getting input from the community. Yes. Because some people aren't going to want their property being restricted to residential or mm -hmm. their property being restricted to industrial, although industrial property brings more value to property as far as value to the current owners than does yeah. residential. But land is one of one very big uh, uh, financial aspect that this county has, and it could be used to the landowner's uh, benefit and to everybody's benefit who uses the land over time. Yeah. Uh, if it's well thought out. So organizing a planning commission would be one uh, one step and getting stakeholder input for development of a general land use plan. And over time, it gets more and more refined according to the needs of the community. Yeah, but and continual surveys. Generally, yeah, I was sorry. involved when Lake Lure, um, Chimney Rock area, they bonded together and they created hired a company out of Asheville and did the, the the strategic planning process. And they had months and months of public surveys and questionnaires and identifying, you know, what do we need? What are we, you know, what are our resources? How do we protect this? Where, you know, and they came, they did a fabulous job. It was a long process, but it was so worth it. And the same thing, in the community that I lived in in Florida, in Davie, Florida, they did the same thing. It was years of planning, continual, was an ongoing process. Yeah. But what, what the result of both of those communities are is that they're prepared for that growth, mm -hmm. that they get to drive the direction of that growth and not have it be driven for you, right? Mm -hmm. And the community has a say in, again, what's provided and what's present in their community. So great, great um, conversation on that. I, I love that. That's a passion of mine too. So let's get it's to- Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. I was going to jump to, uh, all right, number four, managing a county can be seen um, much like managing a business, right? You've got multiple departments. You've got the county commissioner board and they've got EMS, they've got the health department, they've got, you know, all these things that they have to manage, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in looking at that, if each department have, having its own mission to achieve, right, and working to promote, think about it as working to promote the overreaching master plan, if we had one, of the county, would that, how would that work more efficiently? Do you think we're working efficiently now in that sense? Or do you feel like, because I've heard that we work more in silos a little bit, which makes some things difficult to um, address and plan out effectively because you don't have possibly all the information that you need, right? It takes every element of our county and all the departments to work together in order to function at its healthiest, right? I would say that's true. So when one department is lagging or doesn't have, we don't have information on that department that affects EMS or the health department, there's a disconnect there, right? So having more of a comprehensive kind of operating system for that is, is what I've seen in other counties and what I've heard suggested. So um, being that every department is dependent on one budget, right? How do you see operating more cohesively can positively address issues like the tax rates, the economic development, education, infrastructure, recreation, and housing? Because all these things are are really part of, they're a part of one body, the county, right? So yes. how do we connect them to be more efficient and effective? Well, 
you you kind of uh, hit on, on on what what it is, what the solution to that is, and it gets back to this general plan, land use plan, or you know, yeah. uh, the plan. Uh, at any rate, tax rates are going to kind of fall into rate along that, and and I've already covered tax rates as far as property goes in that I don't want to see them raise any more than 2% a year beginning in 2026. I mean, that's what I would propose. That doesn't mean that that's what the full board would would uh, agree to, but certainly that's something to look at. As far as economic development, I mean, tourism we've discussed is the bright spot. Manufacturing, there's many that would like to see some manufacturing come in here. I believe it's good. There's plenty of places to put manufacturing in this county and keep a manufacturing area, if you will, uh, uh, with use of a general plan. Somebody wants to come in and build, you don't want them necessarily building industrial uh, plants up at Lake James. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's yeah. just... it's The it's, one specific, I think, issue that, that I've heard a lot of kickback on is the, is the facility that that borders the you know, part in Burke and part in McDowell County over in the Nebo area and that's been discussed quite often and that's an example of you know trying to find something that there's a big piece of land there but then you're you're dealing with water you're dealing with sewer you're dealing with you know the cost of that and then you're dealing with neighbors so the residents want it how do you provide that information to the neighbors that if this does go here and it's done correctly and we say that it's got to be covered in trees and it's got to be this or that and it looks really attractive this can up your property values you you know what i'm saying absolutely it is cell towers are a prime example of that and cell towers are not the most beautiful thing in the world but if they're done properly they can be mitigated and then the added benefit of having cell phone coverage adds value to everybody that uses a cell phone mm -hmm. in, in the county. So those those are the types of things that, that you, you, you're getting some negatives, but you make them as positive as you can. And that takes stakeholder input, takes input from the community. Not everybody is going to be happy with every change that this county experiences. But the uh, progress is inevitable. Mm hmm and it's the open dialogue, I think, that people are yearning for, that I'm hearing anyway from the public, the people that I talk to. It's that open dialogue and, and being able to have focus groups and say, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing here. And these are the people that are affected by it. What do y'all think? How can we make this better? How can we, you know, just... There was an issue a while ago. This is an example. So when the YMCA built where it was where it is current currently standing there was an issue with the neighborhood behind it because there was a fence built back behind it which was perceived by the neighborhood behind it as an offense and i could you know you can see why it's like well we can't you know if if that discussion i don't know if the discussion was had or not but i'm i'm just going to for this conversation's sake assume that it wasn't had with the neighborhood and that her neighborhood weren't brought in on those plans that could have been alleviated by instead of a fence let's put a tree line here and a walkway into our neighborhood so our neighborhood could enjoy the physical activity you know things like that just that right. that prompting let's think a little forward on how that can be done a little bit differently and that openness that transparency mm -hmm. uh you're right and there are going to be those folks that uh, are not happy with development of, of real estate. But again, Sugar Hill, where they're putting in those dental offices, which are sorely needed, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to benefit the entire community. But that's been laid out really well and thought out long ago. That corridor was thought out. Yeah. And that was a good job there. And those are the types, and it's improved the life of everybody in this community, I think. I think that Ingalls is a wonderful store. Some people may not like Starbucks, but, you know, <laughs> this community didn't have a Starbucks before yeah. that store was rebuilt. Uh, the Walmart has added value. The The new dental offices will add value, and, and it's been planned. And it, it goes back to that general plan. 
-hmm. And it's something that the county commissioner should be focusing on and asking for help from the community. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. you know, if you can get people engaged, now maybe that's more difficult than I think. But uh, I think there are people here who would do it. And you're right, rather than silo each each thing like taxes or education and infrastructure, you you take a look at them and how can they work together with a ge in a general plan? Yeah, but exactly. First, you have to come up with this land use plan. How how do you see the development fifty years from now? Yeah, how much of the lake do we want developed? Or are we going to allow to be developed? Right. You right. know, those those types of things. What's our what's our limit on that? How high do we want buildings in certain areas? You know, we need to decide that make those decisions. Um, how close do we want property lines and business corridors in certain areas? Those things need to be defined in that plan so that, oh, we've got somebody interested. Well, here's our parameters. Mm -hmm. Right. Here's yeah. how we've laid it out in our community. It's a lot of work, and I don't know that the county commissioners are able to do that while they're trying to run a government that's already functioning. Mm -hmm. So they have to reach out to people, and forming a planning commission could be, I'm not saying it is, it could be a, a good first step in this process. But I think a general land use plan would be where to start. Yeah, there's a, and, it is a great idea. And there's the planning commission, they do have other committees for the county um, that people can get onto. I don't know how active those are, and that might be something that we can promote um, at the end of the show, like the website on where to go to get involved in some of those committees to help um, mm -hmm. to have some public input. Um, mm -hmm. Jumping into question number five, there have been many discussions around fiscal responsibility and transparency in community meetings and on social town square sites, right? While the board meetings are published online, many feel that that is not enough. On the other side, many commissioners, rightly so, have expressed that while they understand the public's frustration with taxes and why we don't have an Aldi, Right. There are factors and statutes of which the public may not be aware or are not aware that can sometimes prevent something that may seem obvious to the public. I want to store here. Well, why can't it's, it's a perfect place? Things like that. So name three or four ways the county commissioners can create a more inclusive atmosphere for the public to be not just informed, but engaged to create a shared future for McDowell County that we can all be happy about? Well, I, I think that the the basis, basis of that is communication, uh, which then brings me to the internet. Oh, you know, we're doing this interview, <laughs> internet, and it's only because where I live, the only internet that I was able to get was from the Elon Musk Starlink system. Mm -hmm. There are, are neighbors here that may not be able to afford this type of system right off the bat, or it's monthly. And if they have children, mm -hmm. uh, they need school yeah. in school. Absolutely. Uh, so this this infrastructure issue uh, is important to everything that you just mentioned. And when I say that, I'm I'm talking about technology. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to move forward on that and and give high speed broadband internet to everyone. Uh, when I say give it, uh, make access available. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, it was brought up to me that it isn't necessarily the government's job to provide internet to people. And I understand what they, what they're saying. It's not technically but, qualified as a utility. Well, and although it, there's lobbying to, to, to get that done, it's not currently that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is nowadays in, in this, in the 21st century, which we're a quarter of the way finished. I'm just saying in statutes, when you're looking at statutes, it's technically not, it does not qualify as a utility under, under federal and, and local statutes. Yeah. I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me. The law is always behind technology. <laughs> yeah. right? So that they'll, they'll have to figure out, well, we will have to figure out a way to do that. Now that could be at the state level. After all, the county derives their power from the state and the state derives their power from the federal government mm -hmm. or at least that's the way that they say, all right? But there, <laughs> there's some question on the uh, state power. But uh, anyway, so 
to, to getting back to our, our case in point, I would say that we, again, to improve these things, we're going to have to go back to a general plan, establish one, and see how we can make the parts fit into that. And when I say we, not just the commissioners, mm -hmm. this has to be the community that makes these decisions, you know, and there's always going to be some resistance to development. And it's, again, it's inevitable. Yeah. And and resistance does not necessarily mean that it, there's something that a compromise can't be made. It's just, okay, here's something that we have to dig deeper into and come up with solutions. Yeah. True. And work with people. Don't just dismiss their concerns ad hoc. You know, you need to take a look at, at yeah. why, or is there a solution that's good for everyone? You know, mm -hmm. good, for, good for us, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of wraps up my questions. Any final thoughts from you? Well, I I, I do want to say that although we're not all the way through this uh, election cycle to the primary, I have found this to be a very open and welcoming community as far as this election goes. The, the Board of Elections has done a good job. They've been open, transparent, fair. Uh, I think that the the folks in this community are more than willing to allow people to run for office and give them a fair shot at it. And uh, I think that's a very healthy uh, aspect of this community. Very American. Fabulous. I love it. <laughs> Fabulous. All right. With that, we will sign off. Um, I'm going to send out an invitation to other candidates that are running for county commissioner or school board in McDowell County, if they would like to be interviewed, to please contact me at tina at tinawolf.com. And if you go to the county board of commissioners website, so if you go to McDowell dot, I'm sorry, mcdowellgov.com, and then it's, I believe it's commission forward slash commissioners, and you scroll down to the bottom you'll see where it'll have committees. There's there's a bullet list on the, on the bottom of the video and you'll see where there there uh, is a link for committees that you can become involved in or get more information about. I encourage the public to do that. Craig, thank you again for taking the time out of your day for the interview. And um, until then, good luck. Have a great day. All right, thank you, Tina. Thanks.